Alrighty. Well, since we're a couple minutes after seven, I, I guess we'll get started. Um, and people will continue to kind of trickle in as we go along, which is good to know. Um, at least they, they, they have in the past, which is good. Um, so welcome everybody to our Thursday night nature talk for August 13th. Um, this is the penultimate ta nature talk of the season. Next year, or next week will be our end of season report, um, which will be same time just next week. Um, but for this week, we have Canaries in, a coal, in the Coal Mine with Executive Director of the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center, Ian McLeod. Um, and before I turn it over to him, real real quick, I just want to say, I'm Kelly, if you're wondering. Um, I always forget to introduce myself for whatever reason. Um, and just a quick little bit about these talks and about the um, Loon Preservation Committee as a whole. Um, these nature talks are part of an education series that we do every summer, for, uh, usually held at the Loon Center. This year, we're we've gone digital thanks to the world being as it is, um, but people are seeming to enjoy it. So, hey, maybe we'll do it again next year. Uh, the Loon Preservation Committee has been working in New Hampshire since 1975 to protect New Hampshire's loons um, and their habitats. And we've tripled the loon population in the state since we've started, which is no small feat since they do not reprodu reproduce quickly and um, have a lot of things kind of that can get in the way of that recovery. So um, it, it Seeing three times might not sound that great, but believe it or not, it is actually an amazingly huge number. Um, and yeah, that's about all I have to say. So now I'm going to turn it over to the person you actually want to hear, and that is Ian. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, everybody. Um, I assume you're all out there. That's the weird thing about doing these things digitally. I have no idea. It's like it's like uh, telling jokes to an empty room. Uh, there's no feedback, but I'm I'm assuming you're out there. You've you've never looked better, by the way. Um, thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, this title, uh, the program tonight is called Canaries in the Coal Mine, Bird Population Declines in New Hampshire. I will warn you, this is kind of a depressing program. Uh, it's based on facts and data um, that I've uh, gleaned, but um, it, is, it is kind of uh, sobering to see some of the trends that we're seeing. So a little bit about how this program came about. Um, last year, um, I think I put it together probably about a year ago, I think it was maybe in September um, of 2019, after this paper came out uh, entitled The Decline of the North American Avifauna. It was published in the, the journal Science. Uh, lead author Kevin Rosenberg, Kenneth Rosenberg, a number of other authors, uh, Peter Morrow was, was a very uh, prominent um, one of the authors who, who sort of did, the, did the, uh, the radio rounds talking about the uh, the particular study that they put together. And I'll read a little bit about the, of the abstract. It says, using multiple and independent monitoring networks, we report population losses across much of North American avifauna over 48 years, including once common species and for most biomes. <clears throat> Integration of wide range population trajectories and size estimates indicate a net loss approaching 3 billion birds, that's with a B, or 29% of 1970 abundance. This loss of bird abundance signals an urgent need to address threats to avert future avifaunal collapse and associated loss of ecosystem integrity, function, and services. <clears throat> this paper um, and the publication got a lot of airplay, you know, for about three minutes. As usual, the news cycle moved on very quickly, but they, you know, you did hear things on NPR. There was a piece on New Hampshire Public Radio. Um, there was, you know, quite a good discussion. I think that 29% and that 3 billion number uh, really caught people's imagination. So. Um, it had some really interesting graphs, some very nicely put together depictions of what they were talking about. So uh, hopefully you can see these these graphs. I'm going to use a little pointer here, hopefully to to show you what's going on. If I just click, hopefully you can see that. No, nope, no, nope, let's get this laser pointer. Um, so anyway, there's a there's a red pie chart here um, that shows birds that are declining. Um, and then the blue chart at the bottom is birds that are increasing. Now, there are always winners and losers. Whoops. Yes, the winners and losers. Um, so the blue ones are the ones that are actually increasing. So there are some positive things. But unfortunately, that pie is much, much smaller than the red one. The red one is the bad one. Um, and on the left side, you may notice it says 3.2 uh, billion birds lost in the red pie chart uh, and about 250 million birds gained in the blue pie chart. So vast numbers of species, um, you know, thrushes, starlings, tyrant flycatchers, uh, all of the insect, um, uh, the aerial insectivores like swallows, nightjars, swifts are all declining, finches, larks, 
old world sparrows, blackbirds, wood warblers, and huge swath of American sparrows. Ones that are increasing, maybe not surprisingly, turkeys and grouse. Um, anyone that's driving around New Hampshire right now is probably seeing lots of, of turkey families. They're doing very, very well. Raptors have increased. Um, again, you know, they were a very small number to, to recover from, and so we've spent a lot of resources uh, over the last 30, 40, 50 years managing, bringing back populations of bald eagles and ospreys and peregrine falcons, um, you know, getting DDT out of the environment, and we've seen raptors recover. So a lot of money has gone into bringing raptors back, and they're doing relatively well. But also gnat catchers. Uh, interesting. I wonder what it is about gnat catchers that they're doing so well. Ducks and geese are increasing, probably not surprising to many who are, uh, think of Canada geese as pests, you know, snow geese numbers have, have uh, really increased. Black ducks, again, a lot of conservation work, a lot of national wildlife refuges uh, that have protected wetlands, which of course are great for ducks and geese. So maybe that's not surprising. But then this one really caught my eye, vireos. Vireos are on the increase. So wood warblers are declining quite dramatically in general, but vireos are increasing. What's all that about? So we're going to dig into some of this data a little bit. Uh, I'm going to throw out maybe a few theories on what I think is going on, uh, and we'll bring it sort of closer to home and look at New Hampshire. But they presented all these different uh, the data in some different ways. Um, you can see on the on the right hand side of, or certainly my, which would be your right, yeah, your right hand side of the screen. Um, it talked about you know introduced species are declining, so English sparrows, starlings, things like that. Shorebirds are going down. Land birds as a sort of larger group, water birds, and then you know waterfowl as one that's that's definitely increasing. So, uh, some really interesting ways that they presented the data. Uh, this is another way that kind of shows it by different habitats and biomes. So on the right hand side, that that section D, uh, it shows you know wetland birds are generally you know doing pretty well. And way at the bottom of the list, grassland birds are probably the biggest decline uh, of any of any particular um, you know species group. Um, since 1970. So, you know, very well presented paper, a lot of great research. They used a number of different um, research models, um, studies, data to kind of compile all this. And it was really pretty impressive. Unfortunately, as I said, it got about, you know, three days of press and then it disappeared and I haven't heard a whole lot about it, although it certainly prompted me. Maybe there are other, other folks around the country who have also put together talks that sort of delve into it uh, on a local basis. So first of all, let's talk about that three billion number. Um, it's sort of a hard number to wrap your head around. Uh, they also talked about 29%. Maybe some people can kind of think of that number uh, and kind of give it some context. But I immediately started hearing people, even people that should have known better, uh, sort of misrepresenting what that meant. I heard people actually on the radio say, wow, you know, three billion birds have died in the last 48 years. And that's not what this study is saying. Uh, it's a much, much bigger number than that. Uh, and then I heard some people say, well, I've heard that, you know, cats kill two billion birds a year. So how could it be? You know, they didn't quite understand the context. So just to start off, I thought I'd do a little bit of bird population 101 and kind of how I interpret uh, the data and what they're trying to say. And then we'll start looking at some data for New Hampshire. So a little bit of bird population um, 101, some studies have projected that there are between 10 and 20 billion birds in New Hampshire. I mean, in North America, not New Hampshire, in North America. Um, that's a big, big range. And what I think they're sort of assuming is that, you know, in the springtime, when birds are ready to breed, there might be 10 billion birds. And then at some point during the breeding season, when they produced a whole bunch of young, maybe there might be as many as 20 billion. But then it sort of reverts back to this sort of base population uh, of about 10 billion birds. So let's just go with that assumption. Let's assume that in the spring of 1970, there was a base population in North America of about 10 billion adult, uh, potentially breeding birds in North America. Let's assume that those 10 billion birds uh, have an average maximum biological potential to replicate themselves four times over, i.e. they could produce four eggs, potentially four chicks each in that year. Absolutely, you know, that's in the springtime or for, you know, certainly most, most organisms, that's their sort of biological imperative is to replicate themselves, to perpetuate their species. And so certainly that's on the minds of, of uh, little birds in our springtime is to make lots more little baby birds. Obviously, there's a wide range. Some birds produce huge numbers of eggs, big numbers of chicks, multiple broods. 
Other birds like loons would only lay two eggs, maybe only have one uh, chick. So there's different strategies that birds adopt, but just let's just average it down and say that those 10 billion birds have the, the potential to replicate themselves each four times over. So if there was no such thing as um, predation or uh, loss of birds, there could be 40 billion new birds produced by those 10 billion birds. A net loss, so the net word is very important, a net, net loss indicates that the average annual mortality rate is higher than the average hatch or fledge rate, or what we call recruitment. And it doesn't take much to tip the balance. So just using these numbers, this assumption of about 10 billion base birds, using these numbers in our scenario, a mortality rate of just 0.19% higher than the recruitment rate sustained over that 48 years of this study could result in the type of losses described in the study. And our theoretical 1970 base population of 10 billion birds could shrink, would shrink in the scenario to 7 billion or about a loss of 3 billion or about 29% by 2017. Another way to look at it is sort of like a checkbook. So here's our, our ledger, if you like, for 1970. We've, we're starting out with that 10 billion base population. The potential recruitment could be 40 billion in that next column. So at the end, and then if you add in that mortality rate of just being a little bit higher for whatever reason, and remember mortality, when I talk about mortality, that's throughout the entire nesting cycle. Some birds never even get to breed. They arrive back on territory, they can't find a mate, they get predated right away, the habitat has changed, maybe they do build a nest, it gets destroyed, they lay eggs, they get predated. You know, there's predation at all different levels. It's not just that they produce 40 billion chicks and then over 40 billion die. It's throughout that attempt to breed and replicate themselves, things go wrong. And it's all of those interruptions and what it is that's going on with the bird populations that's affecting that opportunity to replicate themselves four times over. So we're just going to project out um, over the 48 years. So by 1971, there are less than 10 billion birds starting out as your base population. Replicate themselves four times over, mortality rates a little bit higher, and you project that out by the time you get to 2017, your ledger um, is now down to about a beginning balance at the beginning of the year. Again, think of it in terms of money. Uh, now you've ended up because your expenses, your mortality is higher than your investments or your recruitment. Uh, you're starting out with a base population of about 7 billion birds. But over that course of time, look at the number of total potential recruitment that might have happened. It's like 1.6 trillion birds that might have been produced and obviously over 1.6 trillion birds that, are died, that have died in that 48 years. So very different from that, well, 3 billion birds have died in 48 years. That's, that's not what we were, not what the study was saying. So hopefully that kind of gives you just a little bit of a, a context of how I interpret uh, the numbers that they're talking about. And of course, if this trend continues, another 30 years, another 40 years, that those numbers are gonna continue go, to go down if the annual mortality rate uh, continues to be higher than recruitment. So hopefully you're all kind of wrap your brains around the numbers now. Now let's look at some data. So one of the major sources uh, of data that they used was the, the breeding bird survey. Uh, this was established back in the 1960s. Uh, Dr. Chan Robbins, who's wonderful, uh, very strong connections to New Hampshire, his son George, good friend of mine. Um, and George, uh, or at least Chan, produced or created the um, breeding bird surveys. Uh, it was really his brainchild. Um, and basically what it's grown into is this network of over, and this number was from a couple of years ago, over 4,800 routes throughout North America and Mexico. This map shows the ones in North America. Uh, does not show the Mexico ones. I couldn't find a map that showed, showed both. Uh, but it's a very wide scale, continent wide survey that incorporates um, identical protocols for every single survey. So basically the way it works is that each of the routes is a roughly 25 and a half mile route. It's a roadside route with exactly 50 count points or point counts. So every half mile you stop, you get out of the car, you count all of the birds that you hear or see for exactly three minutes. 
within about a quarter mile radius of where you are. So you're not scanning distant ridges. You're not trying to find, you know, very distant birds. You're kind of, you know, identifying the birds that are in the region that you're standing in, about a quarter mile around you. Uh, it's mostly listening. Uh, you do it very early in the morning. You start one half hour before local sunrise. Uh, here in New Hampshire, pretty much all the routes are done in June. There's kind of a period where you could pick a day when you're going to do this route, and you have to complete it in one day. It takes about five hours to do. And there are, as I say, 4,800 survey routes randomly located across the continent, and everybody is collecting that same data in the same way. Many of us have done our survey route for many, many years. It's one of the highlights of our year. We take it very seriously that we want to collect this data. It's all then sent into the U.S. Geological Survey at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. They compile all the data and produce all this wonderful uh, information for us to kind of glean what's going on within the bird populations. These are the survey routes in New Hampshire and New England. Um, you can see uh, these little random squiggles. Each one of those is a 25 mile long, 25 and a half mile long survey route. Um, there are 23 currently active in New Hampshire. And you can see there are scattered ones in, in surrounding states and Vermont and, and Massachusetts and, and across the continent. Here's the route that I cover up in northern New Hampshire, up in Milan. Um, actually starts in the town of Dummer, goes down through Milan into Berlin, right across through the middle of Berlin, crosses the Androscoggin River, and then parallels the Androscoggin River and back up to Dummer. Again, 50 stops. It's the exact same stop that you do every year. They're exactly prescribed. Um, and it's just a very, very robust uh, data set. So I took a look at the data for my Milan route from 1966 uh, to 2018. Uh, as you can see, there was um, one period of time, one a few years um, in the, it looks like 88, 89, and 90, uh, when it was not surveyed, someone uh, dropped the ball or was not able to cover it. Uh, I picked it up, I think, in about 1998 or something like that, uh, and have been doing it ever since, but uh, several people have done it over the years. And you can see when I put in a trend line that the population of the numbers of birds counted uh, has gone down. There's a lot of fluctuation, but that trend line shows a decline. Exactly what type of a decline. So what I did, and I'm going to use this consistently throughout the talk uh, in kind of looking at all the data that we're going to discuss. What I did, rather than just look at the first year and the last year, which would not be a smart way to do it, I did an average of the first 10 years compared to an average for the last 10 years. And that shows a 25% decline in birds counted on the Milan BBS route. So then I thought, OK, well, let's look at all of New Hampshire. So again, went back to the routes, compiled all the data for uh, all BBS routes uh, in New Hampshire. And you'll notice that it describes um, the word by effort. And basically what that means is there's some variation from year to year in the number of routes that are counted. So if one year there were 20, the next year there were 23, because you know maybe the year before somebody couldn't do it, was ill or something, you were going to see more birds or hear more birds where there are 23 routes counted. So just to get rid of that bias, uh, this is by effort. So basically, it's the total number of birds each year divided by the number of counts that were completed, whether it's 20, 21, 22, or 23. There's not a lot of variation in New Hampshire. But in some states, and I looked at surrounding states, there was a much bigger variation, sometimes double the number of uh, BBS routes uh, from what they were 50 years ago. Uh, so this kind of evens things out. So again, you can see when you put a trend line, it's a pretty consistent decline in the number of birds encountered on BBS routes over the last 50 years since 1966 in New Hampshire. And again, when I look at the first 10 years, an average of the first 10 years compared to an average of the last 10 years, about a 24% decline. So very consistent with what I saw in Milan, a little bit less than this 29% that they were talking about in the National Survey, but still, you know, in, in the same ballpark of, of the same sort of declines. So then I took a look in more detail at the different species. So over the course of the BBS survey since 1966 to 2018, 178 bird species were recorded for all New Hampshire survey routes. Of these species, 94, that, or exactly 53%, show population declines. 75 species, about 42%, are stable or show population increases. So that's good, encouraging. 
and nine were recorded so infrequently that really no trends were calculable. And literally, you know, somebody saw a glossy ibis on a BBS route in 1972, and it's the only one ever encountered. You know, it's sort of irrelevant uh, to this study. So I kind of eliminated those, those really unusual species. But what's really interesting, um, and really what the, what the, the paper um, indicated was that really some of the most common species are the ones that have declined the most. So of those 94 declining species, they represented 76% of the overall count in the first 10 years of the survey period from 1966 to 75. Now, those same 94 species represent only 43% of the count from 2009 to 18. So as I say, birds that were some of the most common species 50 years ago have declined the most. So let's take a look at the particular species. So this is the 10 most common species encountered in New Hampshire on all BBS routes between 1966 and 75. Top of the list, maybe not surprising, the American robin. So the average, uh, just shy of 54 American robins were counted per route in New Hampshire between 1966 and 75 as an average. Second was European starling in that time period. Third was red-eyed vireo. Fourth, red-winged blackbird. Song sparrow was next with about 20, just over 23 encountered per route. Wood thrush, 23. Common yellow throat, 22. Barn swallow, 20. White-throated sparrow, uh, 18. Tree swallow, about 17, was number 10. So let's look at what's happened to those species um, over the last 50 years or so. So the American robin, we're all familiar with the American robin. 37% decline, almost 38% decline uh, in robins being encountered on BBS routes. And you can see the data is very clear, very consistent. There's one little aberration in 1970, whatever that is, 72. Not really sure what that is. That may have been a, an incorrect data point where somebody added a zero inadvertently. It's just sort of a funny outlier. Uh, but even with that in there, you can see that the, 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 the decline is quite, quite consistent. It's, it's a pretty, pretty steady model. And when I do that same analysis um, for the first 10 years compared to the last 10 years, it's a 37, almost 38% decline. Some other maps that we can look at that just sort of collaborate, I guess, the data that I'm showing. This is actually straight out of the BBS uh, data, data uh, or website. Uh, they produce these maps for all bird species for the entire continent. And basically, it's a very simple color chart. Red is bad. Red means biggest decline. Dark blue means increase. Yellow means pretty much stable. Orange means a slight decline. Light blue means a slight increase. So basically, you're looking at the extremes here. Blue means good. Numbers are increasing. Um, and you can see for most of New Hampshire, most of Maine, most of New England, really, the robin is in decline. Uh, it's not a drastic decline. It's not red, but it's definitely declining. And that kind of fits the 37% sort of decline that I was finding directly from the, the New Hampshire data. But you can see for some other parts of the country, there's a lot of blue. Um, and again, this is over the entire period of 1966 through 2015. Um, perhaps looking at data more recently, maybe it would look, look different, maybe if you just looked at the last 15 years or something like that. But all of these maps show 1966 to 2015. So a big data set. The next species, remember it was second most common, was the European starling. Uh, really a beautiful bird, much maligned. Of course, most people don't like starlings. They really shouldn't be here. They're from my homeland over in Europe. Uh, we're brought over here. They are something of a pest. Um, certainly people who like kestrels and bluebirds don't like starlings. But here's what's interesting. European starlings are disappearing in New Hampshire. Uh, almost a 79% decline in starling numbers over the last 50 years, and really quite a steady, again, no, no ambiguity about this data. There's no sort of interpretation. It's just going down. So don't, don't worry, starlings are not going to be much of a pest for much longer. They are, they are definitely on their, on their way out or certainly on a very steep decline. And again, we look at that map again, red everywhere, a lot of red, all of New England, basically all of the, um, the northeast corner of the US and up into Canada, um, starlings are declining. Uh, they're doing well up in Newfoundland. I'm not sure what that's all about, but we do see them up in, uh, in uh, Newfoundland. Nice blue up here, doing very well. Who knows what that's all about, but anyway. Certainly around here, they're declining. Red-eyed vireo. Now, remember that, that pie chart where it indicated that vireos were doing quite well? Sure enough, here in New Hampshire, vireos are increasing. Not a huge increase, you know, not staggering, 
but they're not declining, unlike most of these other birds. And in fact, they're the only bird in the top 10 from 66 to 75, the only one that's increasing. Very interesting. Why is it that vireos are increasing? Um, and certainly, if you just looked at that data, if we ran this data set uh, just for the last 20 years, it would be an even more considerable increase. Um, so really quite interesting what's going on with vireos. And we'll talk a little bit more. We'll look at some of the other vireo species, and I'll throw out a theory as to why I think vireos are doing well. And there's the map for red-eyed vireo. A lot of blue. Pretty much all of New England, either light blue or dark blue, they are increasing. They're doing very well. Uh, something's going on with red-eyed vireos. Red-winged blackbirds, not so good. 51% decline. Half as many red-winged blackbirds as they used to be. And again, very clear decline going down, down, down. The map looks terrible. A lot of red, a lot of decline. Song sparrow was number, where are we? Number five, number six, number five, I think it is. Yeah, 33% decline if you just looked Again, looking at that first 10 years compared to the last 10 years, but this data is a little, a little deceiving, I think. As I look at you know, the fact that we had this funny, this big bump, if you were just to look at the last 20 years, you'd probably say that the, um, the trend line would be pretty flat. So I'm not too concerned about song sparrows. Um, I think that 33% is a little bit deceiving, but it's just, you know, I'm just looking at the data in the same way so we can compare apples to apples, but I'm not too concerned about, about song sparrows. Yeah, but you look at the map, and again, it's sort of orange and red. They're certainly, you know, showing a decline over that period of time. Some areas are blue out in the central part of the country, but pretty much around here, they're on the decline. Uh-oh, this is depressing. The wood thrush, one of the most beautiful songs that we have in our eastern forests, disappearing. 84.5% decline from the early years of the uh, BBS roots. And that's, again, very, very clear data. It's disappearing. And the map, very much an eastern species, so much more limited range in the country, but all red, at least on the east coast. Some areas in the mid on the western side of its range apparently increasing, but nothing but red in New England. So the, the beautiful wood thrush is disappearing. Common yellowthroat, yeah, you know, not a big decrease, but down by about 20%. Again, orange and red, a beautiful barn swallow, huge decline, almost 80%, pretty much disappearing throughout the state. Maybe not surprising, we're gonna talk about those grassland species that are uh, probably been hit some of the, the, some of the hardest um, areas. We, we're definitely losing our grasslands. We'll talk about that in a second. Again, that map for the whole continent, a lot of red, all of New England, all of Northern New England, very, very red. Barn swallows are disappearing. White-throated sparrow. Again, one of those iconic species of the New Hampshire northern forest. Disappearing. 71% decline uh, since the, the early years of the survey. And again, just a very clear decline. There's no, there's no messy data there. That's just a steady, a steady decline. And again, you look at the map. Uh, a much more restrictive range. Very much a northern uh, region species up in the boreal forest, northern parts of New England, uh, but certainly all of New England, way up into the Canadian Maritimes, white-throated sparrows are declining. Tree swallow, I think that was number 10. Again, 67% decline, really, really steep decline, disappearing. Another grassland species that's vanishing. And again, look at that map. Very interesting. Southern part of the range, big swaths of blue. So apparently increasing to the south of us, but everything around New England, tree swallows are disappearing. So if we look at all of those species combined, those top 10, remember the only one that was increasing was the red-eyed vireo, that's why it's in green. You can see that 13% increase. If we average out all of the decreases of those top 10 birds back in the, the early part of, this, of the uh, survey, about a 50% combined loss of those species um, since the first 10 years of the survey. So what's going on now? What's changed? This is the new top 10. Red-eyed vireo has slipped into number one. So this again, what we're circling here, this is the uh, top 10 for the 2009 through 2018 for all BBS survey routes uh, in New Hampshire. Red-eyed vireo is now number one. 42, almost 43 red-eyed vireos encountered per survey route uh, in New Hampshire. Robin has slipped to number two, still, you know, common bird. We see a lot of robins around, but it's got that 37, almost 38% decline. 
And then we got a whole bunch of new birds. American Crow has now shot up from 16th place back in the early, the 60s through 1975, uh, now into third place. An average of 27 American Crows encountered uh, on BB, per BB, BBS route in New Hampshire. Chipping Sparrow, doing very well. Jumped from 21 up to number four. Ovenbird, a warbler, doing very well. What is it about our habitat that's made warblers, in, uh, ovenbirds increase? Whereas most other wood warblers uh, are declining. But ovenbirds, there's obviously something different about uh, how they use the habitat that's making them successful. Black cap chickadees, doing very well. Leapt from 20th place uh, up to number six. Common yellowthroat is still at number seven. It's 20% decline, but it's still uh, relatively within the, uh, the rest of the species at number seven. Cedar waxwing has jumped into the top 10 from number 29 in the old days, is now number, number eight. Song sparrow is still in the top 10, but dropped from number five. Red winged blackbird has dropped to number 10. And here's the one that have disappeared. Starlings down at the bottom there, uh, now in 13th place, was in number two. Wood thrush is now in 38th place from number six. Barn swallow down to 32, white throat down to 26, and tree swallow down to 24. So big, big changes um, have happened between that first 10 years, 66 through 75, to the last 10 years. Really, really interesting. Just to continue the story on vireos. So we looked at red-eyed vireo. We've now realized it's the most commonly encountered bird on the BBS roots. It's close cousin, the blue-headed vireo, which is uh, more of a northern part of the state, also increasing. Vireos are doing very, very well, about 106% increase. Pretty steady, you know, kind of data is kind of all over the place, but it's certainly a, a pretty consistent trend line. And if you look at their map for the whole continent, again, more, more restricted range, very much an eastern and, and northern boreal species, a um, lot of blue. You know, most of New Hampshire is kind of light blue, a little bit of orange, so kind of a little bit of declines here and there, but certainly the northern part of the state doing very, very well. The warbling vireo, the other one that we have here, we do have a few yellow-throated vireos in the state. I didn't look at yellow-throated because the numbers are really quite small. We're very much in the northern end of their range, but warbling vireos are fairly widespread. I would say they're fairly flat. They're not declining, um, but, you know, 0.84% of increase, we'll take it. Um, so something about um, warbling or, or all of the vireos is that they're doing very well. My theory, and I'll throw this out, and I'd love to have some, some pushback on this, but my theory is that the tree canopy um, has matured enough in New Hampshire. All of these vireos are primarily high canopy feeders, gleaning caterpillars, uh, which is different from some of the warblers. A lot of warblers are, are taking small flies uh, and other small insects, but, but pretty much universally, uh, vireos are, are caterpillar eaters. There are a lot of caterpillars around. Unfortunately, a lot of them are fairly, uh, may well be invasive. Uh, we're seeing, you know, our warmer summers, maybe there are more invasive caterpillars. Certainly right now, our trees are getting munched by a lot of caterpillars. We've got an invasion in the state of cuckoos right now, which are taking advantage um, of all of the caterpillars, larger caterpillars. But that's my guess, is that vireos are taking advantage of, a, of an abundant food supply uh, of a lot of mature trees reaching a certain age um, with a high canopy and lots of, lots of caterpillar food. But would love to have some pushback on that and hear from other people if they think that's, that's a possibility. Whatever it is, they're doing very well. Oh, there's that's the map for warbling vireo. A lot of, lot of blue, doing very, very well. Let's take a look at a few other iconic species for New Hampshire. So our state bird, the purple finch, what do you think? 60% decline. Sorry, we're losing our purple finches. They're disappearing. Although, actually, if you looked at the last four or five years, you might think they're going up again. But there's kind of a trend. They're sort of up and down and up and down. But the overall trend since 1966 is pretty clear that purple finches are declining uh, in New Hampshire. And the map, once again, a lot of red for New England. Baltimore Oriole. Everybody loves the Orioles coming to their feeders. <laughs> Sorry, nearly a 60% decline in Baltimore Orioles. And again, the map shows a lot of orange, a lot of red. Kingbirds, eastern kingbirds, one of the classic birds of our wetlands, largest flycatcher in the area. 64% decline in BBS roots. Something's going on, we're losing, losing our kingbirds. A lot of depressing stuff. I told you this wasn't a very uplifting talk. 
Again, eastern kingbird, very widely distributed, a lot of red everywhere, you know, from Florida, Texas, New England, just eastern kingbirds are disappearing. They're really in trouble. And yet there are some winners. Morning dove, we all know the story of morning doves. They sort of arrived, spread into New England um, over the last 50 years or so. We're barely really encountered on BBS routes um, until the mid-60s. Uh, here's the data for morning dove. Um, just looking at their entire uh, history in the state, it's about a 217% increase. Uh, you can see way back here, very, very few encountered. But what really intrigued me is, look at this. So they kind of peaked in 1992, and now they're declining. What's that all about? Very, very interesting. And I have no explanation for it. I'd love to have someone theorize what might be going on here. But it made me look at some other species to see if we were seeing another trend, a similar trend with some of these other ones that have increased, because there certainly are several species that we know has been, sp been spreading into the state. The red-bellied woodpecker, for instance, now becoming a really quite a common bird in the lakes region. This past winter, it was probably the most common bird that I heard as I was doing my early season bald eagle nest monitoring, I would hear red-bellied woodpeckers all over New Hampshire, Meredith and New Hampton, and they're very vocal, very noisy. Uh, obviously had a very easy winter this past winter. And you can see there were no red-bellied woodpeckers encountered on any BBS routes until 19, what's that, 96, 97 maybe. Um, and then gradually we've started to see more and more and more and more, and it's a huge increase. Uh, they're now spreading uh, all the way through southern New Hampshire into, into central parts of New Hampshire. Close relative, pileated woodpecker, do also doing really, really well. Steady increase in pileated woodpeckers. That's probably not a surprise to many of you who hear pileated woodpeckers, see them in your backyard, see the damage that they do to your pine trees. Um, pileated woodpeckers doing very well. Wild turkeys, we know the story of wild turkeys reintroduced in the state doing very well. My, where I'm living right now in New Hampton, just families of turkeys everywhere, doing very, very well. Common raven, doing very well. Remember in one of the, the earlier slides, we talked about crows doing well. So generally, corvids uh, are doing quite well, but raven has a nice steady increase in the state. Not seeing any of those sort of peaking in 1992 and going down. So, so far, morning dove is kind of unique. Uh, turkey vulture, again, another species that's arrived from southern climes come to New Hampshire and gradually over the years we've seen more and more encountered and really quite a huge increase. Tufted titmouse, same thing, arrived in the 1960s and just skyrocketed all over New Hampshire. Northern cardinal, same thing, arrived about the same time as tufted titmice. So they're doing really, really well. Northern mockingbird, well, wait a minute, look at northern mockingbird. Here's this very, very steady increase, peaks in 1992. Huh. Is that a coincidence? What's, what's going on there? There's the mockingbird data. If you kind of split it in half, the first half of the data, clearly a huge, huge increase, and then just a steady decline in northern mockingbirds since the, the early 90s. That was really puzzling to me and got me kind of, you know, the, the, one of the fun things about doing these studies instead of digging into the data is you find little rabbit holes to go down. So you kind of jump in and see what you can find. So I started digging in, wondering what it could be that was going on. Here's the morning dove again, very, very similar to, to, mocking, to mockingbird. Why, why would that be? What, what to these two species, what could they have in common? Is it just coincidence? Uh, is it completely two different, different things that are affecting their numbers? So I took a look at the rest of New England, just out of curiosity. Was it just um, a New Hampshire phenomenon? So this is mockingbird data for all of New England. You can see Vermont here. Vermont has many, many fewer um, mockingbirds. Uh, than, than New Hampshire does. Uh, but you can see sort of a, you know, they were around and then they're just about gone in Vermont. Maine, kind of the same thing. They kind of peaked in the early 90s and now dropping off. Massachusetts, same thing, much larger numbers down there. You can see the scale on the left is much bigger. Um, and then steady decline. Same in Connecticut, same in New York, a little messier in New York. But something's going on with mockingbirds. And then the same with morning doves, pretty much the same. A peak and then a decline. Not as marked in New York, pretty steady, but certainly not increasing anymore. So I kind of threw this out to some friends of mine, some, some ornithologists, friends of mine, said, yeah, what do you think? You know, what could be going on here? And one theory that I was thrown at me was the increase in 
Cooper's Hawks. Cooper's Hawks have definitely increased uh, throughout the East. Um, one of those Raptors that's benefited from uh, DDT being banned. Um, they do love morning doves. They eat a lot of morning doves. They certainly eat blue jays. They eat uh, mock they would eat a mockingbird, I'm sure. They're sort of mid-sized birds uh, is, is what they prey on. Their map shows pretty steady increases throughout the East. But when I started to sort of overlay the morning dove map with Cooper's Hawk, yeah, um, didn't seem like there was likely that Cooper's Hawk spreading in the east would have an impact, and the same with Northern Mockingbird. So I don't really buy that theory. There's not that many Cooper's Hawks that I think they could have hammered the populations of, of uh, Morning Doves and, uh, and Mockingbird. But I do have a theory about Mockingbird that I think, um, and, and excuse the pun, but I think bears fruit. So this is some... Uh, one of the things about morning about mocking mockingbirds is that they are frugivore. They eat uh, fruit, berries. Um, they love crab apples. They love bittersweet, um, and they are they winter with us. So they breed here and they they don't migrate. They're very sedentary, um, and what they tend to do is kind of stake a claim um, on a particular group of shrubs that are covered in berries, and that's going to be their winter larder, um, and they'll feed on that through the winter, um, usually in suburban areas uh, in towns. But what this this data shows, this is breeding. Uh, this is not breeding bird survey data, but this is from the Christmas bird count. So this is a count that's done in December, counting winter birds that are here for the winter months. This is for New Hampshire, uh, from going back to about 19 again about 1966. So the same sort of time period. And look at that. In the early 90s, we started to see more and more American robins wintering here in New Hampshire probably because our winters are getting milder. These are birds that are coming down from the Canadian Maritimes, mostly from Newfoundland, and they're spending the winters in New Hampshire. They're finding it conducive to be able to spend the winter. There's lots of fruit. Um, and then I thought, well, that's interesting. Could they be out competing the mockingbirds? And then I looked at cedar waxwing, same thing. We're seeing a much, much larger number of cedar waxwings spending the winter. And of course, cedar waxwings love berries. And then a third one is bluebirds. Uh, Eastern bluebirds have been increasingly staying around in the winter months. Again, our winters are getting milder. Um, there's lots of fruit around. And so what I think happened is that mockingbirds kind of spread into New England. They found lots of berry bushes. And then all of a sudden, competition went through the roof, that we're seeing all these huge flocks of robins, cedar waxwings. Uh, every few years, we get these big influxes of, of bohemian waxing wings as well. And a single mockingbird has no chance of defending its little bush from a horde of 100 or 200 black um, robins or, or wax wings coming in and just stripping the bushes bare. So I've got a feeling that they've just kind of run out of gas uh, and their populations are not able to compete with this sort of winter winter competition uh, for fruit. So that, that's my best guess of what's happening with mockingbirds. But I have no idea about morning doves. I cannot come up with a theory. It's certainly nothing to do with that because they don't feed on fruit. Uh, so it's just a, a total coincidence that their numbers started to decline uh, at that same sort of time. Although maybe it's climate related, but I can't think of what it is that would be uh, causing that decline. But anyway, it's always fun. You don't always answer all the questions, but it's it's fun to dig in and, and sort of dive into this data and see what you can come up with. Thinking of other raptors, we talked about the Cooper's Hawk doing well. One raptor that's not doing well is the American Kestrel. Um, their numbers are disappearing. We're, we've seen steady declines, not only in BBS data, but in hawk migration data across the country, certainly throughout the eastern United States. Um, migrating kestrels are going way, way down. And we've been seeing that trend for quite a while. The American kestrel map is pretty nasty looking, a lot of red, a lot of declines. Of course, American kestrels are one of those grassland species that we talked about, and certainly the um, the paper uh, that was published last year highlighted that grasslands were one of those habitats that we were seeing some of the greatest losses in. Uh, not surprising in New Hampshire, we don't have a lot of grasslands. Um, you know, our farms are being developed into you know housing developments. Our orchards are, disappear are disappearing. Our dairy farms are disappearing, um, and so you know, really, we're not a grassland state. You know, clearly there are a few places, little pockets here and there, uh, where some of these grassland species are hanging on, but uh, generally they are all declining. Uh, this is just kind of a, a grouping that I put together of, of uh, birds that certainly are reliant on grasslands. I could, probably could have added starling into this too. I, for some reason, I didn't, but I think starling 
certainly in many parts of New Hampshire are often associated with, with barns and, and farms, and so that may well be why we're seeing starlings uh, disappearing. But you know, barn swallow, tree swallow, bobolink, 54, 55% decrease uh, in bobolinks here in New Hampshire. Uh, house wren down, eh, not, not a huge number. Uh, field sparrows, 97%. Eastern meadowlark, 99% decline. I can't remember the last time I saw a meadowlark in New Hampshire. Killdeer, uh, savannah sparrow, the only one that's increasing is the bluebird that we talked about. Uh, then you see the kestrel decline. Um, so grassland species are, are definitely on their way out in New Hampshire. They're just going to hang on in a few, a few remote spots. And here's just some, some of the maps for some of those species that we just looked at. A lot of red, except for the eastern bluebird, which is doing quite well. One of those species that we can put nesting boxes up for so we can provide lots of nesting sites for them. Uh, we can feed them in the winter. They'll feed on berries. A lot of people are now putting mealworms out for bluebirds. Um, so bluebirds are, are benefiting from our help. Um, and they're one of those few grassland species that, um, that seems to be responding uh, to our, our attempts. So we've looked at a lot of data. Um, a lot of birds are declining. Uh, let's sort of dig into some of the reasons why some of these birds might be disappearing. So there's a long list of possibilities. Uh, we've talked a little bit about habitat loss, how we're losing our grasslands. Some of that is natural. We're just becoming more forested. Um, the tree canopy is growing to a certain height. Um, you know, of course, 200 years ago, much of New Hampshire was open country, uh, but now we are uh, what is it, 98% forest? It's some huge percentage of, of, of forested landscape. Human populations, maybe that's a factor causing urban sprawl, outdoor cats, people talk about cat predation a lot, window strikes, collisions with wind turbines, collisions with all sorts of other things, communications towers, vehicles, electric lines, um, invasive plant species, pesticides and insecticides, various poisons, Insect population declines, disease like West Nile, avian flu, uh, forest pathogens and disease, increase in native mammalian predators. We're seeing more and more fur bearers, as they call them, you know, in the state. Um, a lot of animals doing very, very well, mammals doing well. Uh, more raptors. We talked about the increase in raptors. Could they be having an impact on our forest songbirds? Uh, and then, of course, climate change. So let's talk about some of these in detail. A lot of people talk about cats. Um, estimates are that there are about 86 million pet cats in North America and an additional 50 million feral cats. Doesn't take much to kind of make an assumption or take a leap to perhaps 2.4 to 3.7 billion birds per year killed by cats in the U.S. Uh, I think this sort of number, you know, if you assume that all the feral cats are feeding at least partially on birds, uh, maybe half of the of the pet cats or have some do some time outdoors. Uh, they would only have to kill one bird every two weeks to get to these sort of numbers. So um, I don't I don't doubt that this is a, a pretty accurate number. Window strikes. A lot of people, you know, everybody talks about when birds hitting their windows. Well, if you imagine how many houses there are in North America, if every single house had even one bird strike a year uh, on a particular window. Of course, there's also the large <clears throat> sky rises or, or um, uh, you know, cities with, with uh, big blocks with lots of glass and light, and we see these awful uh, strikes of birds in migration season. Yeah, some estimates are that perhaps 600 million birds per year are dying because of window strikes in the U.S. Human population is going up, urban sprawl, vehicle collisions. Estimates are that maybe 200 million birds killed in the U.S. each year uh, by bird strikes. Here, here's a mockingbird. There, there's, there's your problem. So I thought, okay, well, all of these things, you know, more cats, urban sprawl, vehicles, that's where more people are. So you would assume that the states where there are more people would be seeing greater bird decline. So I took a quick look at some of the surrounding states. They did the same sort of analysis. Uh, also for some of the Canadian Maritimes or some of the, the Canadian provinces around us. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at Connecticut, uh, the decline um, in birds, again, this was the same by birds by effort. So it sort of weeded out the facts that there's variations of numbers of counts per year. Um, only about a 4%, 4.5% decline in Connecticut compared to Maine, which was the highest one that I looked at, at 35. Obviously, Connecticut's got a lot more people than Maine. I think Connecticut is the most uh, populous state, you know, more people per square mile than any other state in the country. And I think Massachusetts is number two. So that would tell me 
that perhaps cats and people and urban sprawl and vehicles are not the smoking gun um, in this particular equation. So that was kind of interesting. In fact, looking at Connecticut, again, we said one of the most populous states, more people certainly than the New Hampshire and Maine, by far, the trend is actually positive slightly. Um, if you look at the entire span of data um, since 1966. So that was interesting. Take a look at some of those other things we mentioned. Wind turbines, there are apparently something like 50,000 wind turbines in, US, in the US. This data was from maybe a year ago. I'm sure that number's now gone up uh, and will go up and up each year. That apparently data would suggest between 140 and 328,000 birds killed in the US each year. I'm not sure how they calculate those numbers, but not huge numbers. And when we're talking about billions of birds, um, Apparently, there's about 300,000 communications towers in the U.S. Maybe they account for 7 million bird strikes a year. Again, looking at those same, you would think the states that had the most cell towers, you know, where there's more people. So, again, I don't think wind turbines or, or um, communications towers uh, are the, the smoking gun. Let's think about a few others, native mammalian predators, certainly. Um, Raccoons kind of come and go. Their populations seem to uh, be sort of kept in check by outbreaks of rabies. But, you know, in some parts of the, of the country, there are certainly more, more raccoons than there were a couple of hundred years ago. Fishers have certainly increased in the state, although recent data indicates that fishers are declining right now. There are more bears, certainly, than there were a couple of hundred years ago. Squirrel numbers, some people say, you know, we had the, the squirrel mageddon a couple of years ago, but that's all related to food. And then they crashed in numbers. So I Again, I think some years are certainly higher for predation of things like squirrels. Apparently this year, a lot of nests were predated by chipmunks uh, because their numbers were so high because of the, 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 the big acorn crop last year. But again, I don't think that, that uh, mammalian predators have increased that much that they would have the sort of impacts that we're talking about across such a wide swath uh, of the nation. Raptors, we certainly talked about increases in raptors. Um, there are birds, raptors, that, that feed pretty much exclusively on small birds, uh, like the Cooper's hawk, the merlin, the peregrine. Um, I did do a quick look, sort of dug into data, could come up with sort of best estimates of numbers of, of the sort of top five um, raptors that feed on birds, sharp shin, coopers, northern goshawk, peregrine, falcon, and merlin. Amazing to see there's a, a projected to be over two million merlins in, in, uh, in North America. That seemed, that seemed like a big number to me, but anyway, that's what I came up with. You know, even if we project that they took two birds a day, every day, uh, that might be, you know, two and a half billion songbirds that might be taken by raptors. Again, not a huge number when we're sort of go back to that sort of initial uh, bird population 101, when we're sort of trying to come up with, you know, 28 billion birds lost in a year in terms of the mortality. Uh, there's something much bigger going on because even when we add in all of those ones we went through, the turbines, electrocutions, towers, poisons, vehicles, windows, raptors, cats, there's still an awful lot of sort of unaccounted for gray area, uh, potentially, if we believe the numbers I was playing with, um, that's, that's causing these declines. So I think there are two big elephants in the room, as, the, as it were. One is the so-called insect apocalypse. A um, lot of reports, a lot of studies showing absolutely catastrophic declines and losses of insect populations all across the world. Um, and I should say that a lot of the studies, a lot of the data that they presented in this paper uh, is being seen in other parts of the world too. This is not unique to North America. They're seeing similar declines in, in Europe uh, and Asia. Um, so, you know, this is, this is not strictly a North American problem. Um, insect populations are plummeting all over the world. A report said that 40% of the one billion million known species of insects are facing extinction. Uh, Neonicotinoid pesticides, this whole suite of pesticides that have been known now or proven to have caused the crash in pollinator insects like bees, um, showing that they're um, having impacts um, on the body mass of migratory sparrows. There's a lot of new work being done. This is a really depressing photograph taken in China where they now have to hand pollinate the apple trees, I think it's, maybe it's cherries, but you know, something, in order to get any blossoms or to get any fruit, they have to hand pollinate because there are no insects left. 
this cartoon kind of demonstrates too. Remember 20 years ago, you're driving along at night and your windshield would be covered in bugs. It's not happening anymore. Um, yeah, you'll get a few bugs, but you know, not, not the way we did 20 years ago. So clearly the, um, the insect, the biomass of insects is, is dramatically declining. And uh, I'm sure that's what's causing a lot of the declines of, of many of these insect eating birds. And there's, there's definitely a correlation that uh, a lot of the birds that are declining in the, in the greatest levels are insect eaters. So certainly banning the use of neonicotinoid pesticides worldwide would make a huge difference. Uh, they are uh, banning certain products, but there's still an awful lot of them out there uh, that continue to be on the market uh, and will continue to cause problems. The other big elephant in the room is, we've touched on it a little bit, climate change. Uh, we've all seen these graphs of atmospheric CO2, surface temperatures increasing. Here's some data, local data from New Hampshire uh, from a very comprehensive report. Uh, this is data from three different weather stations in northern New Hampshire, Hanover, Bethlehem, First Connecticut Lakes. This graph shows annual maximum temperature recorded from 1895 to 2012. You can see this steady increase at all three of those stations. This graph shows the annual minimum temperature at those same stations over that same period. So what it's telling us is that it's getting warmer, but it's also not getting as cold. And I know that sounds a little obvious, but the range um, is, is really important. This graph from the same report um, shows the length of growing season in New Hampshire is increasing. And again, this is from 1960 to 2012. Um, at three different stations, uh, one of them in Berlin, Pinkham Notch, and Hanover. Uh, so the growing season is getting longer. So what does that mean? Oh, this is another interesting little data point. Not quite as scientific, but kind of interesting, uh, something you may be able to relate to. So this is ice out on Lake Winnipesaukee, obviously very relevant to loons. Um, this data has been collected. It's not quite as scientific. It's sort of a subjective analysis by an individual saying, yep, it's ice out. But I think it's been generally um, sort of tallied in, the, in a similar manner over a long period of time. This goes back to 1887. And if I was to do the same analysis, so this was plotting it um, for every year and then doing an average for the first 10 years compared to an average for the last 10 years, the average for the first 10 years from um, in the 1880s, uh, ice out was April 26th. The average for the last 10 years is April 12th. So a two week difference, uh, ice is going out two weeks earlier than it used to. And what's really interesting is if you look at the, the three latest dates ever were recorded in the first 10 years, and the three earliest dates ever recorded were in the last 10 years. And this year, ice out, I believe, was on April 6th, so right about here. So it been another dot very early um, on certainly well, well below average. So spring is arriving earlier. What does that mean? Just sort of a general statement between 1895 and 2011, temperatures rose by almost two degrees Fahrenheit in the Northeast and projections indicate warming of four and a half to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2080s. The frequency, intensity and length of heat waves, and here we are on a sticky, sticky August night. We just had the third hottest July uh, on record in New Hampshire. Uh, these lengths of heat waves are also expected to increase the total amount of precipitation and the frequency of heavy precipitation events has also risen, although we're kind of in a drought this year. But what happens, of course, is we get it all at once. And so we're getting these very, very heavy downpours between 1958 and 2012. The Northeast saw more than a 70% increase in the amount of rainfall measured during heavy precipitation events. So we're not getting as much rain um, when we need it. Um, we certainly could do with some rain, but when we get it, boy, it comes down hard. And that has an impact. It has impacts on the trees. It has an impact on the soils. It has an impact on birds. Uh, other wildlife when we get these incredible inundations. And so there's lots of lots of sort of complexity to what's going on. Other things that climate change is causing, the range of certain trees and other plant species are moving northward into higher elevations where temperatures are cooler. Birds have to follow. Birds are very specific to certain types of trees, certain tree communities, certain canopies, certain ground cover. Uh, and so as those species shift, the birds need to shift with them. Uh, we know, of course, about uh, maple trees. Sugar maples are expected, uh, at least the range is expected to shrink in the U.S. Uh, as they're shifting further north into Canada. Warmer temperatures are also increasing outbreaks of forest pests and pathogens. 
hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, in pla invasive plants, pudzu, Japanese barberry, honeysuckle, bittersweet, uh, have been expanding their range and, and contributing to a loss of biodiversity, function, and resilience of our ecosystems. Temperature changes also influence the timing of important ecological events, or what we call phenology, causing birds to migrate sooner, uh, to be kind of out of sync with what plants are doing. Plants are blooming sooner. We talked about the, the changes in growing periods, so spring is arriving early, plants start growing earlier. Uh, birds maybe are out of sync. They're not arriving in time to be able to uh, maximize the potential um, sort of calorie input that they can get from the insects that are supposed to be part of the, the blooming of the plants. And so things are sort of getting out of sync. Climate change, of course, is also causing sea level rise, which is going to impact uh, the integrity of a lot of our coastal habitats. So in summary, many birds are under great stress. Insect food is declining. Timing of leaf out and insect abundance is changing. Migration timing is in flux and birds may be out of sync with food. Plant species are under stress. Tree ranges are shifting northwards into higher elevations and many tree species are facing increased threats from disease. These heavy rain events are certainly impacting nesting success and these changes are happening faster than many birds can adapt to. So what can you do? Certainly keeping cats indoors would be great. You know, it'd be nice not to lose those, whatever it was, two and a half to three billion birds to cats. Um, that would help a little bit. Window strikes, you know, strike proof your windows. That would help a little bit. Plant native shrubs and pollinator gardens. Don't use insecticides, protect habitat. But most importantly is demand that lawmakers support federal and state regulations to curb greenhouse gas emissions and reduce global warming. Our climate is warming too fast for a lot of our birds to be able to adapt to, is I think what's primarily going on and causing these huge declines. Otherwise, the canaries in the coal mine are warning us of the impending silent spring that Rachel Carson feared. And that's where I'm going to end. And I would love to take some questions. How did I do? About 8.05. Yeah, usually it's about an hour, and just a little over an hour. So I uh, didn't do too badly, kind of kept on going. So hopefully we'll... Um, allow folks to, to ask some questions. I know there's a little bit of a, a time delay, so uh, Kelly will, will relay those to me. All righty, and I actually already have a few in the chat, so um, we can start with those. Uh, I've got someone who is interested in finding out how you sign up for BBS routes and, or can multiple people run a, a BBS route. Uh, great question. So yeah, um, there's not a lot of BBS routes around. So as I say, there's only 23 currently active in the state. Um, Becky Swamala at New Hampshire Audubon is the regional coordinator. So each state has a coordinator and then they are kind of responsible uh, for really reminding folks and, you know, just sort of checking in. They would be the person that would find out if there was a vacant route, which does happen. Someone might just decide they might move away. They might have an injury. They might have an illness and they can't do it anymore. Uh, that's what happened in my case, whatever it was, 15 years ago, someone was not able to do it. I think Becky asked me if I'd be interested in doing it, and I said, sure. So Becky would be the person to check in with. Uh, you certainly need to go through training. You need to be a good, you know, have a really good ear for birds, um, because, you know, it would not be good if you're standing there, I don't know what I'm listening to. Um, so again, collecting the data in a consistent way, uh, only one person does the survey. So you can have a driver but that driver does not participate. Again, you don't want to have, you know, suddenly four people listening for birds because they're probably going to hear more birds than one person would. So again, to try to minimize any biases in the data, it has to be very consistently done. So it's not a group activity. Uh, it's basically one person who's conducting the survey uh, each year, but um, certainly a survey may come up. Somebody, um, you know, may have a survey route. Occasionally we add a survey. We haven't added many in New Hampshire. There's not a lot of gaps. Um, and it's sort of weird, it's sort of better to have this sort of consistent span that they've all pretty much roughly been covered for the same period of time. Uh, so it's not likely we'll add new surveys. It's much more important to make sure that the existing surveys are covered. So, so really checking in with Becky Swamala at New Hampshire Audubon and just saying, you know, put me on a list if a survey ever, ever becomes vacant and that would be the way to, the way to find out. All right, awesome. That's actually good information for me to know as well, being a birder. Um, Next question is, do morning doves compete with rock pigeons? Uh, no, 
No, I have very different sort of habitats. I mean, certainly morning doves are found in cities. You know, rock doves are, are very much a city species or, you know, towns. They're often around Old Mill, certainly here in, in the Lakes region. You mostly see them around, you know, um, Laconia and Ashland and, you know, places where there are buildings. Um, not so much out in the, in the countryside, whereas morning doves are much more across the landscape. They are a, a backyard sort of suburban species as well, but they're, they're sort of universal. There are morning doves everywhere. Um, so no, I don't think um, they would be uh, competing with, with rock doves or, or um, feral, you know, sort of feral pigeons that we have in the cities. Alrighty, and this one is about uh, Northern Cardinals. Uh, apparently someone has some uh, a ter is having some territorial disputes. They have a regular male and what looks like a youngster and the regular kind of old dad keeps chasing the youngster around. And he's wondering if that is actually like kind of a territorial get out or <laughs> uh, yeah, they can be quite um, quite aggressive in the breeding season. Um, of course, in the non-breeding season, they can be very social. So, you know, I've seen big gatherings of, you know, bird feeders. If you're lucky enough to have cardinals, uh, it's really that, you know, when the hormones get going in the spring, that they start fighting and defending territories and, you know, holding on to their, their little territories. So, so, yes, that will be common if, the, you know, the male is, is breeding, has a mate, is trying to defend a territory. Uh, he's going to see off any any interlopers, even if they're young males. Um, he would still see them as a rival, but um, he'll be much friendlier in the spring, if or in the in the winter when there's um, uh, feeders out that they can all feed together. And then a question: um, I think it's probably where they classify in the list of um, declining, not declining whereabouts. They'd be uh, blue jays and winter wrens. Interesting. I should have, yeah, someone asked the same question about blue, about blue jays. I did this talk two, two days ago for, our, for an audience at uh, the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center, and somebody asked about blue jays. So I did actually look up blue jays, um, and actually they're declining. Uh, not significantly, but steady, steady decline, which was sort of surprising when you saw that ravens were increasing, uh, crows were increasing. Um, of course, jays are, uh, are related to crows. They're a corvid. Uh, but jay populations have, have shown a steady, steady decline. Not drastic, but, you know, definitely, definitely going down. And then the other one was winter wren. Um, mm -hmm. Boy, I'm trying to remember if I looked at winter wren. I think winter wren was down, um, as was house wren. Uh, so, yes, winter wren was, is decreasing. Sort of similar, quite similar, I think, to um, white-throated sparrow. Quite, they're sort of in a, they're, you often will hear them in the same sort of locations. And I think the decline was as, as drastic. Um, winter wrens are kind of interesting too because they're they're much more sort of crash and burn. They have um, they they don't winter very far south, and so wrens will often um, have really bad winters if there's a severe winter in southern states, and we'll see a big crash from one year to the next. But even with those big variations from year to year, the the decline um, over the course of the the 48 year 50 years or so of BBS was 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 quite marked for for winter wren. But I'll, I'll double check that tomorrow. But I'm pretty sure that's the case. All right. Um, and just we have one more question in the chat. So if there are any more that need to go that any any other burning questions, get them in there. Because um, that'll probably give us enough time to answer the first question. And then we'll see what, what's there after that. Um, and that is how does the last question I've got is how does one um, strike proof windows? Ah, well, there's actually, I saw a really great technique. So no, there are a number of different ways you can do that. Um, basically, what you're trying to do is to break up the window. What happens is, I mean, break up the view of the birds through the window. What tends to happen is there are certain windows on your house that birds are going to hit more than others. And what the bird is trying to do is just fly through the window. They don't know what glass is. They have, they, you know, it's going to take them millions of years of evolution to work out what glass is. Um, so they're seeing, you know, through the corner of your house and seeing a shrub on the other side and they're just trying to get there and suddenly this, you know, solid thing whacks them in the head and kills them. Um, so if you can sort of break up the view and apparently birds are much more likely to avoid vertical lines. So horizontal lines, they'll try to fly through. So like a fence, they'll fly through, but vertical lines. So I saw a technique recently using a particular type of marker um, like a Sharpie that sort of had a silver or a white uh, ink in it. And it was, um, and you draw it on the outside, just take a ruler and draw vertical lines that are about, I think it was about a, an inch and a half or two inches. Again, it's, it's online. You can look on it, look online. It was a very, very well explained, very simple. You can scratch it off with a razor blade at some point. It's not a permanent thing. 
and you can hardly see it from the inside, but the birds really notice it. They don't want to fly through those vertical gaps, uh, and they will avoid ba bouncing off the window. So uh, if you have a particular window that you, you have a bird strike on, you're probably going to have another one um, because it's going to be particularly susceptible to that. So that would be the one. You don't have to do all your windows, but you'll find there are certain ones that the birds uh, can't seem to avoid, and so that would be worth, worth trying. Awesome. And it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so I think I think that's it for the evening. Um, thank you, Ian. This was an exceptionally interesting talk. Um, a lot of stuff I didn't know and a lot of stuff to, to give you to think about. Um, and yeah, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, our, our next talk and our final talk is next week. Um, so I hope you guys can join us for that. It will be the end of the season report. So any, all, any and all of the burning questions you've had about how loons have done in New Hampshire, um, throughout this season should probably be answered next week um, and you can also just be there to ask any of them that we don't get to uh, in the chat and um, yeah I guess that's it for the night again thank you Ian this was very interesting my pleasure thank you so much for inviting me and good night everybody good night everyone